I was going to say, um, I have seen representation theorists use hexagonal paper. People have used hexagonal or triangular grids. Uh, well, yeah, triangular grids, actually. Um, yeah, they're also <laughs> all sidings. Mm -hmm. grid. Oh, I meant to. Um, uh -huh. Hang on just a moment. I have another thing that I meant to do at the beginning. Uh, chat. Um, one note, share. Copy link to notebook. Only. Um, uh, I just posted a link in the chat. If Would one of you open it? That should give you a link. Then you'll have uh, access to what I'm writing in in uh, yeah. the one in a web browser also. We probably want to maybe repost this at the beginning of the talk. Since oh yeah, because they disappear. Talk, yeah, it. you're right. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. I do see it though. So Great. The link works. Great. Thanks. So, so um, yeah, I'm still not sure about the exact format um, nowadays, but I think something like half an hour, then five minute break, then another 25 minutes or something along those lines, and then questions. Is that great? Right. Shall we start? You might get a few more joins later on. But, uh, yeah, I mean, let's start. it's a pleasure to welcome Robert Richards from University of Oregon. And he'll tell us this is a two, two part talk. Today is the first part. He'll tell us about stratification of Helen homology. All yours. Great. Um, thanks very much for inviting me. It's very nice to be here. Um, the So before I get started, I'm going to write in this OneNote notebook. My screen is being shared, so you should see that. But it's a little bit annoying that you can't sort of go back and there's not that much space to, like you don't see that much at once. So um, here's a link in the chat. And if you open that, you'll have the notebook itself. And then you can go back to previous stuff or flip forward, whatever you like. Um, what I'm going to tell you about, I had something else to say. Oh, yes. I, yeah, I'm sorry, I think I'm supposed to pause after 25 or 30 minutes. And if I forget to do that, hopefully one of the organizers will, will interrupt me, but I'll try to remember. Um, what I'm talking about is mostly, so this is uh, joint uh, with uh, Shuchit Sharkar or Tyler Lawson and Shuchit Sharkar. Um, Okay, so here's the plan um, for today's talk. If we get through, we might not get quite all of, through all of it, but we'll try. So I want to talk about briefly, just remind you what this stable homotopy refinement of Kavana homology means. Um, so what the structure is. Then I'm going to give you a, just a very brief sketch of what does the what are the steps in the construction, and then we're going to tackle those steps in from easiest to hardest, basically, or from most well under, you know, like most previously existing technology to, to uh, the new part. Um, so we'll talk about the first thing is about taking iterated mapping cones, which is very familiar uh, in some context to everybody and in this context to some people. Um, then I'll talk about a particular way of getting uh, spaces this uh, in terms of first going to something called the Burnside category, Burnside two category of the trivial group and then how that how you can turn that into a spectrum. And then um, I'll talk about the particular uh, cube in the Burnside category that actually gives Kavana homology. So that's the plan. Um, the next talk, I'll talk a little bit about invariance, a little bit about how this connects to another way of constructing spaces, uh, a spe uh, spectral refinement of Kavana homology, and then some computations. Um, OK. And of course, feel free to interrupt at any time with questions. Um, normally, yeah, I can sort of see who looks confused, but here it's a little bit harder. Um, 
Okay, great. So um, the goal is we're going to, uh, given a link diagram L, I want to um, construct a, uh, sorry, already it's wrong, and an integer, a large integer n. Um, I'm going to construct a CW complex, um, which I'll denote XJ subscript N of L, such that um, four key properties. A, um, the cellular cochain complex, um, reduced cellular cochain complex of this uh, CW complex X N of L is isomorphic to the um, ordinary Kovanov complex in grading I comma J. Uh, I guess I should say this is for all integers J, I mean, for each integer J. Um, so I'm constructing one CW complex for each um, quantum grading. Um, the B dependence on N is very simple. So if you take the um, X N plus one J, if you just increase N, that's just the suspension of X N J. C. Um, if L is isotopic to L prime, um, then for sufficiently large n, x, j, n of L is um, homotopy equivalent to x, j, n of L prime. Probably this should be homotopy equivalent to, okay. And D, um, these spaces x, n, j of L are, um, what I'm going to call semi-natural. Which means that uh, IE. Um, <clears throat> given a link cobordism. From L prime to L, there's a map of spaces. again, for n sufficiently large, um, inducing the usual map of uh, Havana homology. KH of L to KH of L prime. Um, so in particular, this means that the uh, carbonism maps on Kavanaugh homology commute with uh, cohomology operations, commute with Steenrod operations. Okay, so that's the goal. Um, uh, note, um, I'm going to mostly ignore gradings, mostly ignore at least grading shifts to avoid having to keep track of them because I'm lazy and also just uh, to avoid the confusion. Um, I'm going to ignore grading shifts and I'm also going to ignore this um, quantum grading J. So I'm not going to, so I'm going to talk about X N of L, which is just the wedge sum over j of these x n j of l's. Again, this is, if you understand what I'm, you know, if we follow what I'm saying, um, it'll be easy to put it back in. Okay. Can I ask quickly about semi-natural? Is it, is the statement that it's not functorial over a composition of cobordisms? Yeah, that's right. So I, um, 
So the maps are defined by first decomposing the carbonism into a movie and then you, so then we should check movie moves and we're working on that and maybe we're almost finished, but it's not, I mean, you know, it's not finished until it's finished. So I think this will get better. I hope this will get better in a matter of months, but. Do these spaces have interesting pi one or homotopy groups? Um, Good question. These spaces have interesting have interesting homotopy groups. Um, they don't have interesting pi one, or at least their pi one is not of interest for knot theory because um, of this point about invariance. So um, it's really only an invariant if you suspend a large number of times. So you, you sort of have to suspend an arbitrary number of times if you're doing a sequence of Reidemeister moves. Um, and pi one, of course, disappears when you suspend. But for example, um, I guess I should give an example. So let's do the unknot. Um, Xn of the unknot is um, Sn wedge Sn. So um, the homotopy groups are at least as interesting as the homotopy groups of the n sphere. Now, I really like Adam. Adam's uh, profile pictures. Every time I look up, I see Adam smiling at me. So I feel like I'm doing a really good job. Um, oh no, he's gone black. Oh no, he's smiling at me. It's perfect. Um, so uh, on the other hand, computing the homotopy groups, maybe you're seeing more just about computing homotopy groups in, you know, in, in homotopy theory than you are about knots. So as a knot invariant, homotopy groups of these things is probably um, not so useful. Uh, more questions? Onwards. Um, okay, um, I'm going to let two be uh, the category yeah. with two objects, um, objects. which I'll call one. Yes. Um, which I'll call one. Yeah, of course. Uh, is this uh, uh, Havana homology modulo two, or uh, oh, this it... notation two? Oh, this notation two. Um, it's just a it's a one dimensional cube. So I just my notation uh, for a cube. I just my notation for it. Oh, but thin root operations are this oh. over z two or? Oh. Oh, anything you like. So you can, you want it, it depends on you. I mean, I didn't write what coefficients. You can take the cohomology of Xn with coefficients in Z mod two, you'll get the mod two C naught algebra, mod P, you get the mod P C naught algebra. I guess C naught operations, I'm just using to mean cohomology operations in general. So I will erase that and write cohomology operations. Stable cohomology operations. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. So, and then my notation is, for example, two squared is um, uh, a cube that looks like that, and so on. So these are categories. Um, <clears throat> so here's the strategy. Um, if our link diagram L has M crossings, then um, uh, X N of L will be uh, the iterated mapping cone of a map. Um, two to the M two spaces. Um, and in fact, each vertex will be sent to a wedge sum of spheres. Um, this is like, um, so the Kovanov complex, CKH, is a mapping cone 
of a map two to the m to um, abelian groups or chain complexes. Um, we're going to get this map two to the m to spaces, so we have to get Can this I, map. Yeah, in sorry, two to the please. m, um, sorry, in two squared up there, are the two, yeah. if you follow the two paths, are they equal? Yeah, they're equal. So they're equal. Because, I mean, two squared is literally this category times itself. So the the notation is actually sort of OK. Well, um, cool and not just homotopic? Um, here? Uh, it depends on your model for, model for the iterative mapping cone. I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll do some mapping cones in next. So um, I'm flexible. I'll write both. Um, I should have written to the M op. I, so there's going to, let me comment on that op before it gets any, you know, before it becomes more confusing. I'm constructing this so that the cohomology of our space is Kovanov homology, which is natural both because Kavanaugh homology you know, was originally described as a co-chain complex. Fine, that's not so important. And because everybody feels more comfortable with, with cohomology operations than homology operations or homology cooperations. So, um, so uh, that's why I'm doing it this way. We can introduce a whole bunch of, of ops throughout all the talks and they're gonna be a little bit annoying. So. A lot of times I'm going to say this is just a little annoying because of the, that convention. Um, OK, to get this map um, by, so um, it's going to come in stages. I'm going to give a map from 2 to the n to something else that I'll call b. So this is the um, burn side, burn side two category of the trivial group. Um, <clears throat> and then there are a bunch of ways that the, there are a bunch of ways to describe a map from this to spaces or spectra. Um, <clears throat> so um, this is this construction is sort of familiar. Uh, in homotopy theory, it's a version of the um, Barrett Pretty Quillen theorem. Um, this particular way of describing um, the Kavanov homotopy type, this was this um, way of describing things is originally due to um, Hu, Krij, and Krij. Um, and then we proved it's equivalent to our original construction. So the original construction I'll comment on it a little bit in the next talk. Um, but this is a little, this is sort of easier to see and has less annoyance. So that's great. Easier to prove some properties too. Um, so there are three steps here. One is I need to say something about mapping, iterated mapping cones. And it's going to be, I'm going to say a little bit more than you expect about that, but in a way that's totally exciting and not at all boring. Um, then um, I need to describe both of these arrows. I'm going to describe the second arrow first because it's, I don't know, more familiar maybe. Um, <clears throat> and I'll give a couple of different constructions there. So I'll describe it in a few different ways. And then I'll describe the first arrow last. Questions about what's coming up? Excellent. I'm going to switch pages to my iterated mapping cones page. OK. So um, so iterated mapping cones. So let's start with the most familiar place, which is complex. So given a map, let's call it, I don't know, f from 2 to the m op to complexes. So maybe I'll draw over here the case of 2 to the 1. So 
what do we have? We have a complex C0, 0, um, C0, 1, C1, 0, and C1, 1, and maps like that so that this commutes. Um, you can take map means functor, of course. You can take the um, mapping cones, um, let's say, along the last factor of 2 to the m um, to get a uh, functor 2 to the m minus 1 up to complexes. So here that would be, I would take this cube and I would be replacing this by um, cone of this map C01, C00 to C01 to cone of the map C10 to C11. Um, <clears throat> so here, just to make sure we're on the same page, this cone this means you take um, C00, uh, maybe with a grading shift, plus C01. And the differential is given by, well, the differential on C00, the differential on C01, and um, this map. Um, Let's call it f of 0, 0 to 0, 1, and 0. Um, OK, plus there's some sign somewhere uh, with a minus sign somewhere. Um, OK, and then you can repeat. And that gives you a. You know, so repeat m times, and you get a single complex. And that's the iterated mapping cone. Um, the same works for spaces. So uh, given a functor um, from 2 to the m to spaces, uh, the same works with um, with uh, cone, the mapping cone of spaces instead of the mapping cone of cone of spaces instead of the mapping cone of uh, chain complexes. Fine. Um, however, um, a functor to the homotopy category. Uh, of complexes or spaces is not enough to do this. Um, you can't take an iterated mapping cone if you just have a function. So i.e. Having, having f commute up to homotopy, having f commute up to homotopy is not good enough. Homotopy is not good enough. And the problem is that, um, so the problem is um, in this arrow here, um, if I look at, so C01 plus C00, um, uh, C11 plus C10, um, This will not be a chain map. So these horizontal maps will not be a chain map. And what, of course, you're supposed to do is you're supposed to put the homotopy in here. So you're supposed to introduce the homotopy here 
as an extra map. But then you have a chain complex, or sorry, a, 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 a map of a chain map, but um, it depends on the homotopy. So, so but um, this, the resulting, resulting uh, chain complex depends on the choice of homotopy. And um, if we had something that was three-dimensional instead of two-dimensional, this thing might, you know, might not even homotopy commute at that point. So um, you can't iterate it at all one more time unless there was inf extra information beyond knowing that it homotopy commutes. I mean, you really might get stuck. Um, okay. Um, however, uh, there's a fix. Um, there's something in between having a diagram that's strict. You see, I'm going to construct some diagrams that don't commute later, but they commute up to homotopy. And I'm going to want to take the mapping cones. And you can't. So I need to tell you what is possible. Um, so there's a fix. Um, uh, there's something in between um, commuting and homotopy commuting. is what's called um, a homotopy coherent coherent uh, functor from two to the n to spaces or two to the n to um, abelian groups, sorry, to chain complexes, you know, it doesn't matter that this is a cube. That's the notion that makes sense for any shape of diagram. Um, <clears throat> so this is, an, this is a definition due to uh, vote and others from the 1970s. And I didn't feel like writing it out, so there it is. Um, and remember the one note, I'll post the link in case anybody came late again, but um, oh, Melissa already did that. That's great. So this OneNote notebook you have access to later, if you like. Um, so what does this have in it? It has, um, okay, for each single arrow, you, for each vertex, you have an abelian group. I didn't say that you were, sorry, a chain complex or a space. I think I'm doing spaces. For each vertex, you have a space. So. And now if you have a single arrow, you just have a map of spaces. That's n equals one, which means there's a, this factor goes away. But now for any pair of arrows, there's a homotopy between doing F1 and F2 and F2 circle F1 is n equals two and this zero one factor gives that homotopy. But then there are a whole bunch of higher homotopies that uh, between these homotopies. Um, so, uh, a good exercise is, if you're interested in the definition, is just to work out the first few cases explicitly. So, um, exercise. So, exercises one. Um, write out exactly what this data is. Uh, what this data is for a map. Um, two to the n, uh, sorry, two to the two, two spaces, or two to the three, two spaces. Um, two, um, say how to take the iterated mapping cone, say how to take the, take iterated mapping cones, iterated mapping cones of maps um, of, sorry, homotopy coherent. Uh, functors, two to the n, the spaces. Um, 
neither of these is very, I mean, this is not very hard. It's just another formula. But uh, if I just wave another formula at you, it's maybe not so useful. So it's better to just figure it out. Um, the upshot is um, um, homotopy coherent diagrams of spaces are good enough. Sorry, cubes. So what I need to construct at this point is a homotopy coherent cube, and then I can take its iterated mapping count. That's the end of that part. Um, maybe this is a good time to pause for questions, and I'm supposed to pause around now anyway, and then I'll soldier on. Great. Um, I have a question, Robert. Great. Um, so this definition of higher of coherent um, cubes, uh, does this, I, I can't quite tell whether this is like a complicated thing or easy to provide. And I'm specifically asking whether sort of this takes men and Schechtman theory and higher Bruhat orders into consideration. No idea, because I don't know what that is. This is the, the definition of, I mean, this definition that I've written down here about what a homotopy coherent diagram is. That's com this is, I didn't say, you know, for every, there's a thing missing at the beginning that I didn't copy that for every object X in C, A space F of X. So, and we're defining a functor from any small category, homotopy coherent functor from any small category to spaces. Again, this is due to vote. Um, I see. So this is a, gen a definition that's very general for small categories and doesn't specifically take the structure of the cube into effect. That's right. It works for any small category. I that's see. Right. So if you take the then structure the of the cube into effect, there should be a vast simplification of the data you need to provide using higher Bruhat orders. I'm going to check one. I'm for it. I, I'm. Th this is already. This is. I know this looks like a big formula, but this is already not a complicated object. Oh, so, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're, you're associating something to every face of the cube of any dimension. So, um, indeed, this is this is doing it. A, there's a subdivision into simplices that this is implicitly associating something to every simplex in, and you can sum those up and get some and say something or whatever, sum up in some sense that gives you a slightly easier definition. Um, so if There's something called the homotopy coherent nerve. That's another way of formulating this, but but this is very concrete. Sorry, somebody was asking something. Yeah, sorry. So if you do it for simplices instead of cubes, this would be some kind of a and change, yeah. Right. Um, this, if you do it for simplices instead of cubes, um, it's not exactly. Um, I don't think that's quite the same as an a infinity thing, but it's in the same general. Uh, region of mathematics. There were some papers a few years ago about with the relation between A infinity algebras or modules categories and homotopy coherence. Um, the, uh, sorry, this is this is in the sort of the style of this like infinity one category stuff. It's just you don't. It's a special case, and you don't need that language in order to say it. So that. There are papers um, explaining that relation, but I don't have it at my sort of at my at my fingertips. The the short version is that there's an operation, whatever. I, I'm I, I can talk about that, but I, I I'll get sidetracked. Um, there's an, the operation you want is something called the DG nerve or the A infinity nerve, and the DG case is in Lurie's higher algebra and the beginning of the second chapter, and it's very simple, but uh, the infinity case is analogous. Robert, so you're going to ensure a coherence by just having isomorphisms of sets in the burn side the category? Yeah, so there are two places that coherence is going to come up. W one is that the burn side two category has these two morphisms, and those, isom those, are, going to be, those are isomorphisms, and that's going to guarantee some coherence. The second is that one of the ways that I'm going to describe the most concrete one of going from the Burnside category to spaces is actually only going to give us a coherent cube, even if you had a commutative cube in the Burnside category. 
it's going to be some punchy argentom type construction. There's going to be a bunch of choices, and we're going to argue that those are coherent. So, so if it stops early on, you don't need anything. You don't need to keep iterating this issue. You can just stop and dimension two well, and everything is coherent. Um, not for the construction I'm going to give you for going from the uh, Burnside category to the to spaces, but you can you can. I could come by giving a. There's a little bit of mess somewhere, so um, I, you can avoid this coherent stuff completely, but that the cost of the way of producing space is being more opaque. But so once you fix this coherence for the set, set isomorphisms and you check that sort of cubes are fine, then you're done. That's that's going to be right. So I mean, that's going to be right. Dimensions. So you stop your that's, coherence that, that's, low dimensions, and that's very different from what people used to in the infinity story. That's right. The, the, in terms of actual work, we're going to only have to check things up to dimension sort of three. Um, so that's, a, that's two steps in the future. But that's um, right. In terms of actual work, we only have to check, check up to dimension three. But, but then I'm going to use checked, this notion anyway. So someone checked the other coherence from dimension three to infinity in the general setup for any Bernstein Q category data. In fact, I'm going that. to do that for you on the next part of the in the next part of the talk. So um, yes, that's been well understood by homotopy theorists for 30 years or something. But I'm going to just do it for you so that I don't have to say, you know, go study the literature. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, it's the sort of person that I am. Um, more questions. Uh, let's can, shall we continue the talk? Great, we'll do that. I'm for it. Okay, Burnside two category and functors from it to spectra. So, um, um, so note. Let's talk about sets. So sets have um, disjoint union, which I'm going to think of as plus and product, which I'm going to think of as times operations. So it's whatever, bimonoidal. Um, so um, that's, I can talk, that's what you need to talk about matrices of them. So I can talk about matrices of sets. That is, um, a matrix where the entries look like um, a set one, two, seven, empty set, five, 18, 30. Um, so the Burnside two category of the trivial group has um, objects, uh, finite sets, S. Um, harm from S to T is the set of T by S matrices of sets um, and um, uh, two harm from one matrix A to another matrix B is um, the set of uh, entry preserving bijections, entry wise bijections of sets. So I better do something of an example. So let me do that. Um, so for example, um, if S is the set um, one, two, three, and uh, T is the set four, five, and U is the set six, seven. Then um, here is a um, U times T matrix of sets. Put that down a bit. Um, so U has, you know, has 
element six and seven, T has elements, sorry, it should just be two by two, four and five. And at each, at each entry, we have a set, um, A, B, C, empty set, D. And here's a T times S matrix of sets, um, E, F, G, empty set, um, H, I, J, K, L. Um, and I can multiply those if I multiply. So here, I should tell you what the labels are. So that's four and five and one, two, three. And you can multiply them. So you do that in the usual way, which I have to use my fingers for. So for example, um, the this top left entry of the product is um, A E um, A F B E B F C H. This is very exciting. Um, C I and C J. And then there are some more entries. Okay, so um, this was an element in HOM from T to U, and this is an element in HOM from S to T, and this is their composition. Um, so I claim to have explained the first two parts, to give an example of the first two parts. The last one is just if I had, for example, another um, element of HOM from, uh, let's do that. So here's another element in HOM of UT, um, sorry, TU, HOM of TU, um, C, uh, X, Y, Z, empty set, W then um, a map between these, a two morphism is a bijection there and a bijection there and a bijection there and a bijection there. Um, so um, if I call, let's call this element say A and this element B, then HOM from A to B um, has two elements because there are two choices of bijection in the top left and everything else is this unique choice. Um, I'm gonna mess around with it. This category is gonna be like central to everything else I say. Um, questions about it before, before I keep going? So this is the category of corresponding correspondences between finite sets and isomorphism oh. of correspondences. Oh yeah, good you asked. I meant to say that. In other words, Um, uh, HOM of ST is the set of roofs or correspondences A, S, T, and composition is, uh, is fiber product and um, HOM from A to B is just diagrams like this. Thanks. More questions or things I should have said. So there seems to be some sort of additive structure because given two roofs of the same S and T, you could take their union. Yeah. That's right. There's also a matrix addition. Um, I think I'm not going to use that, but that's right. I, I was just going to ask if there's a, <clears throat> a presentation of this category by generators and relations. It would be a, it would be a lot harder to do that if you don't use the matrix addition. But if you do it, that's it fair. I have no idea. That's a great question. Um, I don't know. Thanks. I think it's 
probably complicated, but I don't actually know. I think if you want it as a tensor category, on the disjoint union of S and T, and I think you don't have that. Oh, well, okay, I don't know. It's a good question, then. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Are the sets... Oh, oh. Are the sets within any one of these matrices assumed to be disjoint sets, or are they like, could you have the same symbol appearing more than once in the same matrix? I think it doesn't matter because we remember where it is in the matrix, but just think of them as disjoint. Okay. The, 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 they, they, no, they should be disjoint. Because the they addition be is a formal disjoint union. So, like, so if you That's had the right. same if you had the same term appearing multiple times, it would appear multiple. It would be counted multiple times. That's right. That's right. So so. That's right. There's actually there's a lot of slightly annoying stuff if one thinks about it in carefully that I want to not think about, and none of it turns out to be important. But like. You could ask whether matrix multiplication is associative because of this issue, you know, these issues like A times B times C is not equal to A times B times C for sets. They're, you know, they're canonically in canonical bijection, but you can fix all of that by, by taking things to be embedded in Rn or something. So there's sort of standard tricks for getting around that. So just don't, don't, don't think too much about like whether matrix multiplication is associative and stuff. Um, we, in our paper, we're careful and we explain some way to get around that. So like, if you really care, we wrote it down. Um, and it, it's not in any way due to us. Okay. Um, so um, there is a functor from, I don't know if I introduced the notation, I'm going to call the thing the Burnside category above B to spe spectra, um, think spaces, I mean, think CW complexes um, as follows. Um, so I'm gonna call this functor K. So um, I'm gonna give you, this is version one of constructing the functor and then I'm going to give you version two, which will be more detailed, and version three, which will be less detailed. So you can check, you can take your choice. Um, so if you have a set S, K of a set S, so this is on object, um, is just the wedge sum over S and S of what I'll write as bold S. This is the sphere spectrum. Um, and think Sn for n large. Okay. Um, B. Okay. Given one of these matrices or correspondences A from S to T, um, uh, wedge sum is the sum in spaces. So it's it's a co-product in spaces. So pointed spaces. So to define um, K of A suffices to define the map on a single S sub S uh, for some S in S. You know, if I wanted to find a map from a sum, I just define it from each sum end, okay? Um, so this is uh, since wedge sum is um, a co-product. Um, also, um, since wedge sum is a product in spectra, not in spaces, but in uh, stably, it's a product. Um, it suffices to define the projection to the factor corresponding to T for any 
T and T. So again, I have currently um, S A, this sits inside the wedge sum over S in S of S, sorry, S, S, S. Um, this maps, so I'm trying to find a map to the wedge sum over T and T, uh, T of S. This projects to S T. That's using the fact that, again, that wedge sum is a product. And this is what I, it suffices to define this bottom arrow. Um, OK. Well, the matrix, and so I have a matrix entry. A S T. This is a finite set. So what do we do? I take SS. Spheres have a pinch map. Um, so what you can do is you can pinch it a bunch of times till you get the wedge sum over um, a in a s t of s, and then fold those together. By which I mean you apply the identity ma map on each factor to s t. Okay, um, and then c, um, given an isomorphism of I mean. Isomorphism, sorry, two morphism. Can I just quickly ask something, Robert? Yeah. So um, I know you were ignoring gratings. And so I understand that the quantum grading would just put some of these spheres in different J's and we don't really care about That's that. Right. But you're not ignoring any sort of shifts, suspensions in this? I'm not. Like... They're all, so those are going to, the suspensions all come out of the iterated mapping cone construction. That's a good question. So Got it. we don't, all of the spheres here, you should think of as spheres of the same dimension. It's like, you know, when you have a chain complex, all of the individual Z's are like Z's in grading zero, but then you take a mapping cone and they go into all sorts of different gradings. Thanks. Perfect. Sure. Um, and then for the two morphisms, um, you just shouldn't be very happy about this pinch map because like, which pinched off piece became for which element of the set uh, A. And this pin, the two morphisms have something to do with reordering those sum ends. Um, I find this a little bit opaque and rather unconvincing. And also, so the two things that are not so nice about this, one is, um, is this point C is a bit upsetting. The second is that this point here, we really had to pass to spectra because of this product and spectra thing. And here we sort of chose a nice uh, inverse of um, the inclusion from the wedge sum of the spheres uh, to the product of the spheres. Um, and we need to know that that has some good associativity and commutativity properties. Okay, that was all sorted out by homotopy theorists in the 80s-ish. So that's all well understood, but it's not well understood by me. So let me give you a more concrete construction. V2. Um, as expected, I'm a little bit behind. So I'm probably not going to quite get, to, I'm not going to get to the third part, which is constructing the functor. But fortunately, there's a second talk. So um, I'll get to that part there where I construct the map to the Burnside category. <laughs> Um, version two. Um, so given a cube, um, I'm now going to be sort of a wimp and um, uh, just talk about cubes. I'm going to get a homotopy coherent Uh, cube of spaces. Now we can really do spaces, not spectra. So um, on objects, it's just the same as before. So um, 
uh, so let's call this map something. Let's call this F. So um, my cover topic coherent cube of spaces, let's call it something else. Uh, let's call it G. So G of a vertex V, that's a vertex in the cube, is just what it was before, the wedge sum over um, S in uh, F of V of S capital N, the sphere. Remember, we have some N bigger than zero fixed, large, and I'll tell you how large it has to be in a minute. Um, this is the same as taking the disjoint union over S in F of V of dn and then quotienting by the whole boundary. Um, on morphisms, on edges, doesn't matter. On, it doesn't matter. On morphisms. So given, um, V to double, say W to V in two to the M, we have this um, matrix um, F of W to V. So that's a matrix of sets. Gosh, time is nipping at my heels. Here we go. And um, so again, wedge sum is, is a sum. So I'm going to just define, uh, so fix some S in F of W. Um, and I'm going to define a map Sn to the wedge sum over T in F of V of Sn. And here's how you do it. Um, embed the disjoint union over T in F of V of A S T, sorry, of F of W to V S T. That is, um, this is the column of our, we have a matrix of sets and I'm embedding the disjoint union of this column into uh, DN. Okay, so I embed the whole, this, the whole column corresponding to the matrix entry that we're looking at, the, the S that we're looking at into DN. Okay, so here's my DN and I've embedded that whole column into DN. Then, um, the Pontryag, there's a Pontryag and Tom like collapse map, which takes DN to um, the uh, F of W to V sub ST, disjoint union over T, of that mod boundary. What on earth? So I've embedded it. That moves me a little, choose a little disk around each of these points and collapse everything that's outside these little disks. So that gives me a map to a wedge sum of a bunch of spheres. Um, and then this maps to the wedge sum over um, T in F of V of Sn just because each of these little disks was associated to some T, right? Each of these little disks is some element in here, which has some T corresponding to it. And so I map that component just by the identity map. So this is like a wedge sum of identity maps to SN. Um, now I should say something about um, on two morphisms. Um, I won't say much, but this uh, there's dot, dot, dot. Um, here I had to choose an embedding and here I'm gonna have to choose a path of embeddings.
Um, and then there's these, there are these higher homotopies that are going to correspond to choosing paths of paths of embeddings. So this extends to a homotopy coherent cube. Um, if n is large enough, large enough, which is like bigger than little n plus 2, um, because the space of embeddings of um, k points into dn is like n minus 2 connected. And all we're doing in order to get this homotopy coherent cube is we're choosing, we're connecting various different embeddings by, you know, families of embeddings are filling in by disks. And there's no abstraction of doing that because the space of embeddings is highly connected. Um, so this gives us our homotopy coherent cube. I'm going to use my last minute to give you V3, and then we'll stop for questions again, um, just so that we're done with this. V3 is. Um, so there's a map from the Burnside category to the category of permutative categories, which sends a set, uh, so it sends a set X or S, I've been calling it X, let's call it X, to the category of sets over X, that is sets together with a projection map down to X, finite sets over X. Um, and now there's a functor from, Permutative categories, this is a fancy category. It's what's called, a, it's a, a, a multi-category. It's like an operand. Um, so permutative categories, there's a map from that to spectra that was introduced by Elmendorf and Mandel. Again, it's somehow the underlying ideas are similar to what was being described above, but that's said very differently. It's called the Elmendorf-Mandel machine. But in fact, it's not due to machine, it's just due to Elmendorf and Mandel. Um, and this is something that was developed for study, this sort of infinite loop space uh, stuff in homotopy theory. Um, so this is called K theory, which is why I called the functor at the beginning K. So K theory of primitive categories. And so composing there gives this map to spectra. And it's the same. So it's, the, it's equivalent to what we did in the, this concrete description above. Um, except theirs is more functorial and better behaved because they don't make any choices, but it has a lot more co-limits. Um, okay, I think that's it for today's talk. So I, that what I owe you is I need to define the map from the cube to the Burnside category and then talk about how you might compute this and why it's invariant and so on. Um, that's it. Thanks, guys. Thank Robert. Questions? Yeah. Um, so Robert, I think I had a misunderstanding that I want to uh, clear up. So who Krish Krish's stuff came before you and Sutrit's work, right? No, later. No. And in fact, it was based okay. on discussions with us. So okay. it's, not, it's, it's after us and it's also not independent. OK. Um, what happened is Igor wrote to me to tell me that our paper was wrong. And after some discussion, he decided that, in fact, a paper was right, and he knew how to write a paper, too, So, which is nice. But this stuff is okay. very nice. Great. Thanks for clearing that up for me. Sure. Robert, so next time you'll write down what the maps and sets are for various diagrams. That's right. I'm going to tell you what. Um, so the value of vertices is going to be easy. It's just the usual generators for the Kovanov complex at that vertex. But then, I, and the maps for edges are actually also going to be easy. The only new information is in these coherence maps for the associated to faces. So it's going to turn out, you don't know that yet, but it's going to turn out that the only interesting information is in the sort of two category piece of the Burnside category associated to faces. So there are no choices to make in the correspondences. Um, there are no choices to make in the correspondence as well. 
we we make the choices for you in a global way. But like, yeah, there are no choices to make. I'm give you a canonical way of defining the correspondences. Well, I'll give you two canonical ways of defining the correspondences because that's how we're doing these for some reason. So there are only two ways um, to set it up so that you have coherence, so that you have isomorphisms. Um, that's a very bold statement. I mean, I, I only, I know, I make, there's a global choice that I'm going to make. And that's, you know, there, there are two options for that global choice. And that's the only way I know to do this. But I don't have a theorem that says that's the only way to do this. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. Let me stop the recording and we'll continue with questions. Great.